to the Opposition Day motion in the name of the Leader of the Opposition on Environment and Climate Change, I must inform the House that I have not selected either of the amendments. To move the motion, I call the Leader of the Opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg leave to move the motion standing in my name and that of my colleagues. Today, Mr Speaker, this House must declare an environment and climate emergency. We have no time to waste. We are living in a climate crisis that will spiral dangerously out of control unless we take rapid and dramatic action now. This is no longer about a distant future. <clears throat> We're talking about nothing less than the irreversible destruction of the environment within our lifetimes of members of this House. Young people know this. They have the most to lose. I was, like many members of this House on all sides, deeply moved a few weeks ago to see the streets outside this Parliament filled with colour and noise by children chanting, Our planet, our future. Yeah. For someone of my generation, it was inspiring, but also humbling that children felt they had to leave school to teach us adults a lesson. The truth is, they are ahead of the politicians on this, the most important issue of our time. We are witnessing, I will give way in a moment, we are witnessing an unprecedented upsurge of climate activism, with groups like Extinction Rebellion forcing the politicians in this building to listen. For all the dismissive and defensive column inches the processes have provoked, they are a massive and, I believe, very necessary wake-up call. Today, we have the opportunity to say, we hear you. I thank my honourable friend for giving way, and as my neighbouring constituency MP, could I congratulate him for many years ago giving up his vehicle and using mainly his bicycle for years as a Member of Parliament. <laughs> Indeed, we have. I fear, I fear, my my friend has unwittingly provoked lots of strange thought processes amongst members opposite. <laughs> of course, I'll give way on the basis of bicycle. <laughs> And at the opposite extreme to his bicycle, the largest source of carbon emissions in the country is, of course, Heathrow Airport. Given that, isn't it folly to be going ahead with a third runway at Heathrow? And wouldn't it be a clear indication from the Secretary of State today if he said that they were not pursuing that course? I thank my friend for that intervention, and obviously aircraft emissions are one of the major problems that we face in this country and all around the world. And like him and other colleagues, I was actually opposed to the expansion of Heathrow because I want to promote more surface transport in a more sustainable way, which is mainly on railways. Then I will give way over there, and then I'll give way there, and then I'll carry on. <laughs> right honourable gentlemen and fellow cyclists for giving way, uh, would he agree with the young people who are outside this building that it would be easier and better to tackle climate change as if we remained full members of the European Union. Well, I congratulate the member for Tottenham, since he represents an absolutely wonderful town where environment is at the very core of the lives of many people in, in, in that town. We're not here to debate the EU or Brexit, for which everyone will be very pleased. Um, but, I would, but I would say that uh, under any proposal, from my party, we would import into the UK all the environmental regulations the EU have adopted, most of which are very good and progressive, often don't go far enough, and there would be a dynamic... Uh, just very gently ask the right honourable gentleman to face the House so we can all hear. Yes. You're absolutely the last person I'd want to be offensive to, so I do apologise. <laughs> um, that uh, we would uh, ensure there's a dynamic relationship with those regulations. So I'm trying to please both sides at the present time, but in fact you're probably... <laughs> the joy of politics when we want to protect our environment, Mr Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, I give way to the uh, member there, then the, my colleague. From I'm very grateful for the right on giving way, and it's very interesting how he's proceeding with his Brexit policy. It will be noted outside this place. Um, but does he agree with me that to beat climate change in this country and around the world, we've got to green our pension funds, green our banks, green our stock exchanges, decarbonise capitalism, to drive trillions of dollars into the green, clean energy investments that we need? A very fair point. The, a very fair point the honourable member makes, Mr. Speaker. And indeed, in a former life, I was a trade union organiser and negotiator. Even then, we were discussing with the, we were discussing with the pension fund trustees how they would have environmentally sustainable investments, and we would use it as a way of promoting green energy and issues like that. And I would urge people, many millions of whom have shares in pension funds, to do exactly that. It's a very fair point. Yes. I'm grateful to him for giving way and welcome the fact that Labour is now following the Green Party lead when it comes to calling for a climate emergency. Make a mockery of a climate emergency. We are one of the worst countries in Europe for giving subsidies to fossil fuel industry. Would you agree with me that it is not compatible with a uh, climate constrained uh, economy to go on with these subsidies to fossil fuel companies? Well, indeed, what we need is sustainable energy policy, and that I'm going to come on to in my speech. And I obviously pay tribute to the Honourable Member for the work she's done on this, and often she and I have been on exactly the same side on these issues of environmental sustainability. I'll give way a couple of times more, then I ought to make the get on my speech, otherwise the Speaker will tell me off because others want to speak. For giving way, but just on that point of fossil fuels, does he recognise that natural gas has done more to decarbonise this country, reducing our levels to hasn't been seen since 1888? And does he also recognise 280,000 jobs are supported by the oil and gas industry? Is he concerned about those 280,000 jobs? We want a sustainable energy policy in this country, and I didn't hear all of the members' intervention because others were talking, but if he's talking about issues of fracking, he knows perfectly well that this party is opposed to it because we want to see a more sustainable world and a sustainable environment. I give way to... I thank my honourable uh, friend. I thank my honourable friend for giving way. And does he share my concern about the lack of urgency in the government's own targets that it acknowledges it needs to meet? For example, by the time we, do, we uh, meet the uh, meeting uh, reducing plastic waste target, I will be 66. Does he share my question? <laughs> Well, the whole point of today's debate is about declaring an emergency in order to focus all, all of our attentions on the sheer urgency of the issue. Because it isn't going to go away, it's going to get considerably worse unless we act and set an example to other nations to also act. To give way to the Chair of Select Committee. I thank my right honourable friend for giving way, and um, I congratulate him on, on declaring an environment and climate emergency. I wonder if he'd seen the report that the committee produced last week, stating that if we leave um, the European Union, the watchdog that the government is currently proposing is toothless because it does not have the power to fine government for breaches of air pollution, water quality and waste standards. Does he agree with me that that is a very, very big barrier for the government to overcome? Thank my friend for that intervention and for the work her committee does and the report they produce. It has to have all the teeth that are necessary to make sure the actions are taken. And as I pointed out to an earlier intervention, there has to be a dynamic relationship with European regulations in order to achieve it. So I thank her for her work and for that intervention. I'm going to give, make some progress, then give way to some more uh, colleagues. Uh, Mr Speaker, I've been a member of this House for 36 years, and in that time I've observed something about this place that is glaringly obvious but seldom acknowledged. Parliament rarely leads change. It usually drags its feet. It's normally the last place to pick up on the major reforms that society is demanding. Think about the huge transformations in our society. Workers' rights, women's rights, gay rights. The impetus has always come from outside, from social movements and communities, while Westminster is often the last place to understand that. Let us not repeat that pattern. Let's respond 
to what a young generation is saying to us and raising an alarm. So by becoming the first parliament in the world to declare a climate emergency, we could, and I hope we do, set off a wave of actions from parliaments and governments all around the world. And surely, Mr Speaker, if we lead by example and others follow, that would be the best possible answer to the all too common excuse we all hear on doorsteps, why should we act when others won't? Today, this side of the chamber was absolutely packed when my honourable friend, the member for Cheltenham, introduced the bill to hired wire, hard wire, net zero into our economy. Where was the opposition then? I'm not entirely sure what point the Honourable Member is trying to make, except I'm very pleased that she's here today and I look forward to hearing her contribution. Mr Speaker, we... we I thank my right honourable friend for uh, giving way. Public sentiment and Labour's position is clear. We must declare a climate emergency and legislate for net zero emissions. But the government is procrastinating. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that the political will to tackle climate change is there with the public, it's there on these benches, but it's absolutely lacking on the benches opposite? I thank my friend for that intervention. Let us show today the political will is here in this Parliament to declare the climate emergency we believe to be necessary. So, Mr Speaker, let us work more closely with countries that are serious about ending the climate catastrophe, especially those at the sharp end of this, like the small country, the Maldives, so vulnerable to rising sea levels. They told the UN climate talks last year we are not prepared to die, and implored countries to unite. And Bangladesh, whose foreign minister recently warned of the existential threat posed by climate breakdown to the 160 million people of his country, and he urged others to adhere to their commitments under the Paris Climate Change Agreement. I I attended the Paris conference in 2015 with my good friend, the Honourable Member for Brent North, and I'd like to thank him for his passion at that conference, his commitment to environmental sustainability and the great work he did on forestry during the last Labour government. It's a pleasure to work with him. He, along with the whole Labour Party, strongly, and I just make this point, strongly support the UK's bid to host the UN Climate Change Conference in 2020. And I really hope that it does happen. And when it does happen, members of this House from all across the House will have a chance to interact with those attending that conference. And let's make clear to President Trump that he must re-engage with international climate agreements. And we must be absolutely clear-eyed about the Paris Agreement. It is a significant breakthrough, a huge breakthrough, but it is not enough. If every country meets its current pledges, if I make this point, if every country in the whole world meets its current pledges as per the Paris Agreement, temperatures will still rise by three degrees in this century. And at that point, Mr Speaker, Southern Europe, the Horn of Africa, Central America and the Caribbean will be in permanent drought. Major cities like Miami and Rio de Janeiro would be lost to rising sea levels. At four degrees, which is where we're all currently heading with the rates of emissions that are going on, agricultural systems would be collapsing. This isn't just a climate change issue, it's a climate emergency. We're already experiencing the effects around us. Here at home, our weather is becoming more extreme. The Chief Executive of the Environment Agency recently warned that we're looking into what he called the jaws of death and could run short of water within 25 years. Yet at the same time, flash flooding is becoming more frequent. Anyone who has visited the scene of a flooded town or village knows the devastation it brings to families. That was vividly brought home to me when I visited Cockermouth after the 2015 floods, 
along with my good friend, the Honourable Member for Workington, who is doing such a brilliant job as Shadow Environment Secretary, who first challenged the Government to declare a climate emergency a month ago. And around the world, we're seeing ice caps melting, coral reefs dissolving, droughts in Africa, hurricanes in the Americas, and wildfires in Australia. Cyclone Idai has killed more than 900 people in southeast Africa, mainly in Mozambique, and affected three million more, only to be immediately followed by the current horrors of Cyclone Kenneth. The heating up of our climate is contributing to the terrifying loss of animal and plant species, something we sadly are only just recognising. I remember working with and joining WWF when I was at school. And according to what they're saying now, this is World Wide Fund for Nature, humanity has wiped out 60% of mammals, birds, fish and reptiles since 1970, a year many in this House can remember. Early this year, the first global scientific review of its kind found that insects insects could become extinct within a century unless action is taken. Insects pollinate plants and keep the soil healthy. Without pollination and healthy soil, there is no food, and without food, there is no life. Meanwhile, we are, I think, having far too much very intensive farming pumping the earth with too many fertilisers and taking its toll on our soil. Soil degradation is a major issue, and anyone who reads any farming journals will pick up this all the time, the weakening of soil and soil structures and the need to strengthen them. A more sustainable farming system actually leads, in the longer run, to better yields and less cost in pesticides, herbicides and fertiliser. The Environment Secretary himself has warned that we only have 30 to 40 years left before our fertile soil is eradicated. So I hope he will be supporting the motion today. I thank the Leader of the Opposition for, for giving way. And can, I, can I agree with what he said about President Trump? And it is time that he re-engaged with the Paris Agenda. And dare I say, it is a good subject for after-dinner conversation. But can I, can I ask him, because he mentioned about leading by example, and he says, right, this country must do that, even though it is a small part of overall global emissions. Where in the balanced energy policy of the future should he become Prime Minister? Where does coal sit in that energy policy? We see a growth in renewable sources and green energy, and I'm coming on to that in my, in my speech, and a reduction in the use of fossil fuels on this. I give way to the member at the back. For him giving way, and I recognise he has allowed a lot of interventions. Um, I think the reality is we can all agree that there is an emergency on environment and climate change and he's setting out some of the reasons why many of us, I think most of us, all of us, would yeah, probably yeah. agree with yeah, yeah, yeah. what this motion is saying. But isn't it time that this House stopped scoring cheap political points and started being prepared to actually try and find a consensus? And all I would say to him, in, in all genuineness, is if he's willing to sit down and try and find a consensus on Brexit, is he willing to sit down and try and find a consensus on something that is arguably far more profound, which is this issue of climate change? Yeah, yeah. Last week, the leaders of uh, the parties in Parliament, with the exception of the Prime Minister, attended a round table with a group of young people, led by Greta Thunberg, to discuss that very issue. Yes, I am very happy to sit down with anybody to discuss the issues of our environment and sustainability, and I invite the Honourable Member to do exactly the same. Yes. Well, gentlemen, he is being generous with his time. On the subject of coal, does he now regret the comments that he made while he was seeking to become leader of his party in 2015, that he was in favour of reopening coal mines, and does he therefore deplore the recent decision in Cumbria to open a new coal mine there? 
I, I don't regret any of the statements I made in the 2015 leadership campaign. I was talking then about the way in which the coal mining communities in South Wales have been so disgracefully treated by the government that he supports. And, uh, and on the question of the Cumbrian mine, yes, there is an issue there. There is an issue about the supply of coal that will always be necessary for the steel industry in order to fuel blast furnaces. That's why I'm talking about a balanced approach to energy, which does recognise the need to have sustainable industry as well as reducing emissions. None of this is easy or none of it is simple, but we have to move in the right direction of reducing emissions, reducing carbon dioxide emissions, and a cleaner and more sustainable environment. Thank my honourable friend for giving way. And can I agree with him on this uh, ecological crisis that we are facing? I am hosting Chris Packham here in Parliament today to meet parliamentarians. Can he join him and also the Environmental Audit Select Committee in calling for a conservation audit to look at really what is going on out there? in our biodiversity with our species. My friend, for that intervention and compliment her on her work. I think, um, I think an uh, audit like that would be a very appropriate response to this debate that we're having today, because she's quite right. Unless you actually examine the biodiversity loss, in particularly where there's monocultural agriculture around the country, um, and the urban areas as well, then we're not going to know just how serious it absolutely is. So I do support. I'll give way one more time, then I'll move on. I'm very grateful. Isn't one of the most disturbing aspects of this climate emergency the fact that some of the poorest people in the world live in the land that is closest to the rising sea levels? And if people are truly concerned about mass migration today, they should be truly worried about, um, about this crisis because those are the people who are going to be travelling, um, moving many millions, of mi many millions of people, trying to find a safe place to have clean drinking water and a home for themselves. Yeah. It's, a, it's a, very, a very good point, and indeed I'm coming on to that um, in a moment, because uh, the heart of the environment issue and climate emergency is really one of justice. It's those here and around the world who are least to blame for it, who bear the burden of it and the highest cost. A 2015 study found that children living in our British inner city areas can have their lung capacity reduced by up to 10% by air pollution on major roads. And of course, it's even more extreme for those children growing up in densely populated urban areas in India or China at the present time. We're damaging children before they reach the age of five by the levels of pollution in many cities around the world. Children shouldn't have to pay with their health for our failure to clean up our toxic air. In a moment. And it's working class communities that suffer the worst effects of air pollution. Those who are least able to rebuild their lives after flooding who will be hit hardest by rising food prices, while the better off, who are sometimes more responsible for the most uh, emissions, can pay their way out of the trouble. And internationally, in a cruel twist of fate, it's the global south which is facing the greatest devastation at the hands of drought and extreme weather. This fuels poverty and war and creates refugees as people are forced to flee their homes. Some, not all, but some of the 65 million refugees in this world now are in reality climate refugees. These people are paying the price of emissions that do not come from the global south, overwhelmingly come from the global north and rapidly industrialising societies. As Sir David Attenborough recently said in his, I believe, brilliant programme on television. I quote, We now stand at a unique point in our planet's history, one where we must all share responsibility, both for our present well-being and for the future of life on Earth. That is the magnitude of what we're talking about, the future of life on Earth. It's too late for tokenistic policies or gimmicks. We have to do more. Banning plastic, good, important, but individual action is not enough. 
We need a collective response which empowers people instead of just shaming them if they don't buy expensive recycled toilet paper or drive the newest Toyota Prius. Mr Speaker, if we're to declare an emergency, then it follows that radical and urgent action must be taken. According to the, inter in according to the, I'm coming to, according to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to avert the disastrous effects of warming greater than 1.5 degrees centigrade, global emissions must fall by about 45 per cent by 2030 to reach net zero by 2050 at the absolute latest. It's a massive demand and it's a massive ask and it's not going to happen by itself. So we are going to have to free ourselves from some of the harmful beliefs that have characterised our thinking for too long. The hidden hand of the market isn't going to save us. Technolo technological solutions are not going to magically appear out of nowhere. An emergency of this magnitude requires large-scale government intervention to kick-start industries, to direct investment and to boost research and development in the green technologies of the future. And that is not a burden. I'm extremely grateful to my rise old friend and congratulate him on, on leading on this debate. Does he agree with me that during the last Labour government we did create a consensus on this issue under the yes. Climate Change Act, ably led by my right honourable friend, the member for Doncaster North? Yeah. And that consensus included working together, not just with ourselves, but international partners. And will he join me in congratulating the Welsh Labour Government on declaring earlier this week an emergency climate emergency? Yeah. Yeah. Friend for the intervention and absolutely agree with him and I am coming on to the, um, the work done by the last Labour government which did so much to try and bring about an awareness of the climate emergency. I'll come to the member in a moment. It's a chance, Mr Speaker, to bring new manufacturing and engineering jobs to places that have never recovered from the destruction of our industries in the early 1980s. What we need is a green industrial revolution with huge investments in new technologies and green industries. Away, he talked about, he, he's absolutely right to declare an, a climate emergency and a broader environment emergency. He talks about uh, radical actions. One of the actions that we need to take, surely, is to protect the world's forests. After transport, it is the second biggest source of emissions. We're destroying around 20 million acres, a mind-boggling amount, every single year. Billions of people depend on forests directly for their livelihoods. So from the point of view of biodiversity, humanitarianism and climate change, that surely has to be a number one priority for yeah. any government. Yeah. 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 Right. It, it does have to be a very high priority. I'm coming on to that uh, towards the end of my speech, but it is absolutely correct that forests not only sustain a high level of biodiversity, they're also a huge source of carbon capture because it's locked up within the, within the trees themselves, and I'll be coming on to that. Historically, the industry that changed Britain was coal. I give way, then I move on. Okay. It's my right honourable friend for giving when he's making a really powerful speech about the need to address climate change. Does he agree with me that if the government was really committed to tackling climate change, they would not be investing in fracking? They would instead be investing in renewable energy sources like tidal energy, like more solar, that would help areas like mine in the North East. Indeed, and she knows my views on this. And, uh, uh, I attended a public meeting in a, in a village in Derbyshire discussing fracking and what impressed me was all the people that were there were determined to improve their environment and wanted a more sustainable form of generating energy than by fracking and they were worried about the danger it was doing in pollution levels to groundwater and other issues so I thank her for that intervention. Coal powered the first industrial revolution in Britain but it was done on the backs of the working class at the expense of our environment. So the green industrial the Industrial Revolution will be both unwinding those injustices, harnessing manufacturing to avert climate breakdown, as well as providing well-paid, good-skilled and secure jobs. Imagine former coalfield areas becoming the new centres of development of battery and energy storage. Towns like Swindon, which uh, proudly made locomotives 
becoming hubs for building the next generation of high-speed trains. Shipbuilding areas that were once the heart of shipbuilding, now diversified around the world, actually had a new, a new impetus in developing offshore wind turbines and all the technology that goes with them. I want to thank the Honourable Member for Salford and Eccles for her work on the Green Industrial Revolution and Labour's plan, which will create, we believe, hundreds of thousands of jobs in renewable energy. She's done great work, and I thank her for that. The solution to the crisis is to reprogram our economy so that it works for the interests of both people and the planet. It means publicly owned energy and water companies with a mandate to protect the environment instead of just seeking profit. It means redesigning public agricultural funding to benefit local business and sustainable farming that supports biodiversity, plant life and wildlife. And it also means not unnecessarily flying basic products across the globe that could be transported in a more sustainable way. It means funding home insulation schemes, particularly where there are poor quality homes, especially in the private rented sector. And I pay tribute to the work done on retrofitting homes and the work I saw being done at Salford University when I went there with my friend the MP for Salford, where they're working on the efficient conversion of back-to-back -back terraced houses into sustainable homes with energy efficiency. It means investing in bus routes, cycle routes and infrastructure and reopening railway lines and improving railways, I believe, in public ownerships, so that people can travel quickly and cheaply, not necessarily by car. But it also means big investments, like the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon, yeah. and not prioritising fracking, which rides roughshod over local communities and damages our climate. And it means planting trees to improve air quality and prevent flooding. And it means expanding our beautiful forests that absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and provide habitats for wildlife. Sadly, the United Kingdom has some of the lowest levels of forest cover across Europe. It has expanded somewhat. It needs to go a lot faster. And we must support expanding tree planting initiatives like those in Leicester and Milton Keynes and, of course, the uh, brilliant initiative of the National Forest in Leicestershire. It's actually very exciting to think about all the opportunities we have if we take them. But if the funding of Natural England is slashed in half, we can see how austerity and cutting of funds <coughs> reduces our ability to act. Internationally, Mr Speaker, we must ensure that our defence and diplomatic capacity is capable of responding quickly and effectively to climate disasters around the world. We must take serious steps on debt relief and cancellation to deal with the injustice of countries trying to recover from climate crises they did not create, whilst at the same time struggling to pay massive international debts. The debt burden makes it even harder for them to deal with the crisis they are facing. And so I do think in our aid policies we need to end the support for fossil fuel projects in the Global South. Um, yes. Um, I thank my right hon. Uh, friend for giving way, and he's making a, a very powerful point about the importance uh, of justice. On Monday this week, I went to meet uh, Year 4 at the Milford Academy uh, in my constituency because they'd written about their concerns about deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Isn't it vitally important that we listen uh, to the views uh, of young people? Because they are the ones who will be hardest hit if we fail to act. And aren't they absolutely right to call on us here today? to commit to action to protect their futures. My friend is, is absolutely right, and that the message is that we need to do far more in this country, but we also need to carry that message elsewhere. And I can't be the only person in this House that was very disappointed by the statements made by President Bolsonaro of Brazil concerning the future of the Amazon rainforest. It's a precious, precious asset for the people of Brazil, as well as something necessary for the whole world. 
we will be in danger of forcing into extinction species that we never even discovered. Yeah. And that is exactly what is happening at the present time. So it does mean a creative thought process in our international relations. <laughs> Mr Speaker, the last Labour government brought in some of the most ambitious legislation in the world with the 2008 Climate Change Act. And I want to pay a special thank you and tribute to the Right Honourable Member for Doncaster North and others that brought it in. He did incredible work to ensure that happened. And I remember his work at the Copenhagen Conference in 2009 when the UK was given a prime seat in the negotiations because we had a genuine respect on this issue because of the Climate Change Act that he had piloted through Parliament. But since then, I'm sorry to say, we've fallen behind. Members opposite will boast that the UK is reducing carbon emissions, but I have to tell them it's too slow. At the current rate, we will not reach zero emissions until the end of the century, more than 50 years too late. By that time, our grandchildren will be fighting for survival on a dying planet. The point Greta Thunberg made to me and others when we met her last week was listen to the science, which I thought was a very impressive thing for her to say on behalf of um, all the young people that she was uh, working with and speaking for. The IPCC has said, and I quote, that limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade would require rapid, far-reaching and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society, and that such action is urgent. The science says this is an emergency. But an emergency does not have to be a catastrophe. We could use it as an opportunity to rebuild our economy so that it works for the many, not the few. But it's time to not allow despair to take over. It's a time for action. We can do this. Government can improve the lives of our people while defending our natural world. What we do in this country can have an impact around the globe. So, Mr Speaker, let's embrace hope. The children in school get it. They get it right away. They grasp the threat to their own future. And, in fact, they want to be taught more about it as part of the curriculum and their normal school day. As are, we to content, are we to be content to hand down a broken planet to our children? That is the question we must ask ourselves today. We have the chance to act before it's too late. It's a chance that won't be available to succeeding generations. It is our historic duty to take it. I urge members to support the motion before the House today. Thank you.